Okay, in this video I'm going to show the configuration editor found in RetroPie. It's a menu system that allows you to get access to some of the configuration files that are otherwise maybe a bit more difficult to edit or update. And um, there are different ways of editing the files. You can just go in manually in the terminal session, like you can see on the right hand side of the screen there. Or you can use a more sort of graphical interface using the RetroPie menu setup on the left. Or you can even use RetroArch GUI itself to a degree to change some of these settings. But often the quickest and easiest way, certainly if you're just um, sort of making changes to see how they affect the output, is through this configuration editor. So I just want to run through some of the options that show um, how it works and what changes they make, because it can be quite a quick way um, of making some updates that really improve the output or way that RetroArch based emulators or LibRetro emulators um, output, especially on uh, HDTVs. So on the left there you can see I've got Emulation Station and I've got the three screens there, a couple of terminal sessions and Emulation Station and I'm sure if I was better at video editing I could probably merge it all with um, a few snazzy fade in fade outs but um, I can't do that so I'm doing this instead but hopefully you'll get the idea. So okay you can access this configuration editor uh, in the RetroPie menu which is on the screen at the moment so if you go in there and scroll down to configuration editor. As it says on the left there, you can change the common RetroArch options. And RetroArch is the front end for all of the LibRetro emulators. So, and it's typically, it covers the majority of emulation. So it will often do the job you need. It won't make any effect whatsoever on standalone emulators like DGen or GNGeo or any of the ones that aren't prefixed with LR basically for LibRetro. Um, okay, yeah, so it lets us edit those settings, also some other global configs and some configs that aren't to do with RetroArch. Uh, it gives you a nice interface to be able to do that. Like I say, it just helps not having to know some of the intricacies maybe of navigating through a Linux file system. So if I go into the configuration editor and select that, you'll see the screen change and on that screen I've got the menu option which is the same as the one I've got in the top right. And I'm going to use that one in the top right to sort of show how I navigate because it'll display easier. And we'll just use Emulation Station to run the game so you can see the changes it makes. So I'll quit out of that on that screen. There we go. Okay, so that's quit out of there. And what we'll do is run um, some Mega Drive games so you can see the change. Now if you look in the top right, we've got um, two options to start off with. You've got the basic settings, which is basically just a cut down version of everything that you can find in the advanced configuration. It just keeps it simpler to the common changes that you might want to make. Um, so we'll start there and in that section, you can see the options are largely in the beginner section to change options for specific systems. It's got each of the systems that are installed here and you can just choose the one that you want to make the change to or you can make the change for everything so for example if you want to say I want video smoothing on everything I run you would want to make the change in this top section here and if I chose that top section you can see it's got a really useful bit of info at the top saying anything you change here will change this file and that RetroArch file is used um, no matter which RetroArch um, or which emulator using RetroArch you use, it'll always read that. So anything you make change here, you'll see take effect in all of them. So I think to make this easier to see, what I'll do, if I cancel on that screen, but choose a specific system, in this case Mega Drive, they're all the same um, options, it's just which system you decide to choose. So I'll go for Mega Drive, and I've got 10 options. So these are the cut down basic options that you want to use. Now, on the emulation station there, if I run the game without making any of these changes, so I'll open up Sonic, and we'll just see how the graphics look. Now you should be able to see there, around Sonic and the sort of circle behind, it's quite jagged. Um, it looks sort of quite um, blown up a bit maybe. It doesn't look particularly um, authentic compared to how it might look on a CRT so it's not the ideal sort of output what we can do we can change the video smoothing to make make a difference there so if I quit that 
and over here we can choose video smoothing, press enter there, uh, set it to true. There you go, it's done, set it to true. And we can see what that's done before we run the game again by just navigating to the, the file. This is, if you did it manually, you can do it this way as well. So I'll change directory to where that's made a change, which is in here. So it's edited the RetroArch file there. Open that up, you can see now video smooth equals true has appeared in there. That wasn't there before, so that's automatically put that line in for you to save you having to do this um, manually. So I'll quit that. Now that it's smooth, I'll run the game again, and you should see smooth effects, particularly on that sort of sonic icon to start with. You can see it a bit there as well, it's slightly blurry. There you go, it's softened that whole view. It looks I mean, to me, it looks it makes it look slightly blurry. I prefer the default of off, but it's a very quick way to make the output look a little bit better on a HD TV, and maybe on your custom setup, it suits it to have this option on. So that's the change it makes. So I'll quit out of that and back up on the options again. For the sake of it, I'm going to change that back to off. Well, I could say false, but I'm going to unset to make it go back to the default which happens to be false. But if I unset that and then check that file again, you can see it's added a, um, a hash at the start. So it means it'll ignore that line. So it's still there, hasn't taken it out, but it won't be read because um, I've put that value there. Um, or rather the system, the auto configuration has put that system there. Now I did say the hash, it mean, means it ignores the value, but in this case here, it doesn't ignore this line because the way that include command works, what it's saying is for the Mega Drive, run down all of these settings and then run through the all configuration. And this just makes um, all of the default systems uh, settings kick in as well. So that's that should be there, don't worry about that. Everything that you put before the line will override, as it says at the top there. So it'll override um, anything that's in the default and that's why it's put it there. Okay, so that was the smoothing. Then you've got aspect ratio. We choose that by default and um, the unset value will be um, I think the defaults config effectively or core but the point is um, the aspect ratio will be as per the original um, emulator so everything should be fine there and that's why you get the black bars at the side because it won't fill your widescreen TV because it was a 4-3 ratio before but it's quick to change if you did want um, a wider screen or a wider view um, to be output, you can change it to 16.9 here. So I'll just quit that, and if I did change that to 16.9, which you, you shouldn't do, it's an odd resolution to try and stretch to. But anyway, in here, you can see now aspect ratio index equals one. So I'll fire up Sonic again. And that's filling up my whole screen. And as you can see, that looks pretty horrific. I wouldn't do that, but the options are there if you want to stretch it. It's very quick and easy to do, as you saw. Yeah, that just looks bad. Okay, so we'll quit that and come out of that. And we'll change the aspect ratio back to the default and set. And again, it's just put that hash. You could manually take these lines out if you wanted, but... Um, yeah, that's where we've taken that default out. Okay, so the next bit, render resolution. A render resolution is the res that it will, um, the Pi will output the emulator to. Um, at the moment, the default will be whatever your TV is. So if you watch it in 1080p, the render resolution will be 1080p. And the Pi 2 and Pi 3 can do that quite happily and it improves the overall quality. But maybe if you had a Pi 1 and you had a 1080p TV, and you're running a shader it might go a little bit slower than you'd want you could sort of see a bit of lag in which case you can reduce the um, the output or the resolution so I could go in there and reduce it right down to I don't know something really low and then the hardware does the upscaling to your TV but um, let's see if we can see a difference I'll put that there and we'll see what that's put here so okay so it's put the full screen um, settings there. I'm not sure why it's put that below 
this line. I would have expected it to put it above, but that said, I don't think they're set in this file anyway, so I won't get it won't not work if you see what I mean. But um, anyway, let's put it there. You can see it there. So I'll quit that and see if uh, I can notice any difference. The aspect ratio should. Ooh. Doesn't it a million miles different there? But on the startup, you could see that um, it was at low resolution because the the text was much bigger and blown up. And technically, this is probably marginally faster emulation, maybe because of the low resolution that it outputting it in, and then it's getting upscaled. But like I said, I, I mean, if it's not um, if you're not noticing a lot of slowdown, I wouldn't bother changing it at all. Yeah, anyway, let's quit that one. Okay, and we will change render resolution to unset. Now, video shader and overlay are really useful, important changes for graphical output. The shader applies a graphic, I suppose a, a type of overlay, or it affects the graphic graphical output to emulate a certain type of um, a certain type of video like scan lines or um, maybe quite a, a CRT effect in, in the like the um, what are some of the options like watercolor effect you can get really odd changes to the graphics to um, affect the way they're output and it does take a bit of a toll on the CPU um, depending on the Pi you've got as opposed to overlays that work a bit differently but they, the shaders are probably the most effective way to get a very authentic um, change to the graphics that make it look uh, like it was in the 80s or 90s. So in video, video shader, it will only work if you enable it, obviously. So by, I forget whether it's enabled by default, but we can check. I won't check, it doesn't matter. Right, we can go here and we can enable it. So it's definitely enabled now, and we can see that here. So we've got um, video, oh, that's interesting. When I turn that default off, it's moved it above the line. Anyway, video shader enable, true. So now shaders will work, but you won't show anything because we haven't set what shader to use. So setting the shader to use, you get the preset options here. You can upload your own as well, but these are the, the defaults that have most effect. And I'd say the most popular is this one, CRT Pi. So I'll select that one, and we've got that now chosen. So you can see in here it's added a line where that video shader is. And if I start Sonic now, it should look much better. There, that certainly looks a lot better. I don't know how well it's coming across on the um, capture, but it looks a lot better on the TV. It's kind of got a scanline effect going on in general, sort of CRT um, look and feel of it all. There are plenty of other shaders to try as well. Let's, let's give another one a go. So if I go in the video shader file, video shader, we could do. So look at snares. I think that one was always. Not too bad. I think this might have a slightly softer effect, maybe. Yeah, it's not so pronounced. There's not really a scanline effect on this one, but it does soften the. Right, I'll just check that's shown. Yeah, video shader is true, and it's got the file name there. So it has changed the effect, although that's pretty subtle. I can't see much difference there. Let's try another one. Let's go for let's go for something extreme. This a look. This would definitely look different. No, that doesn't look massively different. Eh? Let me just check that's there. So it's called SNES Scanline 
uh, SNES Scanline GLSLP. Yeah, okay. Maybe I just can't tell much difference there. Just try that one, it should clearly be different. Just want to make sure it is doing it properly. So we've got here the video shader path, and we've got here that it should be set to on. So I quit that. Yeah, I can see that's um, that's on there. I mean, it looks a bit odd, but it's clearly changed it. Okay. Right, enough of shaders. Um, but try them out because you'll notice a quite big difference quite often. Uh, it's a very quick and easy way to do it. Um, so we turn that back on. Oh, hang on. Configure basic for Mega Drive. Video shader. And set. And enable and set. Okay, now there's overlays. Overlays are literally a graphical file that sits on top of the image. So it can be quite useful for filling in if um, you're emulating a 4-3 ratio and you're doing it on a widescreen TV, you'll get black bars at the side. And quite often people want to cover up those black bars. So an overlay can do it. At the side there, it might put a picture of maybe side of a TV or side of some uh, retro characters like Sonic or something, any, any sort of picture to fill it in. And then in addition, the section of the image that goes over the top of the actual game area might have a scanline effect. So you get the benefit of hiding the black bars and a scanline effect in one. Plus, it's comparatively low CPU usage. It's just loading an image. So they can be very effective. And there's a lot of different overlays out there. And obviously, there's some included in this distribution. So we can say we want to use an overlay. And we'll use, uh, let's have a look. Um, let's see what that is, TV integer. OK, so we've made those changes. And again, you can see them appear in the file. This is starting to look a bit untidy, but you can always tidy it up manually. Um, ba -ba -ba -ba. OK, so we've got input overlay tree, and that's the path to the configuration file that references the image. And you can always edit that and have a look if you want to see what's in there. Anyway, that's there. Run it again, and we should see um, quite a change. Yeah, well, okay. There's a bit of an issue there in that it's clearly not the right size for the way that I've output the video, but you get the idea. You can hide the, the sides there. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay, right, we'll cancel that. And looking at the overlays, I wonder if I can find one more suitable. I mean, that is a point with the shaders, it'll automatically just cover the game area, whereas the overlays kind of need to know what resolution you're outputting um, to. Uh, CRT bezels, so horizontal, or probably for horizontal games, maybe, because they've considered that, maybe. Uh, run that. Hmm. Not sure about that one. Okay. Uh, let's try one more. Got, okay, so they're borders, they're effects. Um, scan line fade integer. CRT bezels. Game pads. Don't want game pads. Okay, let's try a scan line one. Okay. So this is probably scan lines all the way through, so it might not cover the black sides but it might give me a CRT effect yeah you can see that going across there so another way to put um, scan lines on that doesn't look too bad 
again it's trial and error see what suits you best and that's that's the changes that they make so quit that and we'll turn overlays off or and set them back to default okay and then player one use analog stick as d-pad let's um I haven't got an analog stick on the controller I've got in there at the moment, but I'll just set it to see what um, it says. So left stick, there, input player one, analog D-pad mode equals one. So it's just saying that um, that should that should work just as a normal D-pad if you've got the analog option. So just another way of um, hooking that in. Okay, so they're the basic options and the changes they make. So if we quit that and go back here, you can see you could also do that instead of a per system basis, you can make the change on the lot. And if you made the change on everything, the the file you'd be editing is down here. It'd be in this directory here, apt retropy configs all, and in that directory you can see there is the retroarch. Um, there, the RetroArch CFG that um, manages all the default settings. And if I open that, you can see there's quite a few pages of uh, all the little sections there. So you can just make a change there and it would apply to all the systems. Okay, so that's all the basic ones. Now in here, instead of configure the basic options, if you go for advanced, you can do the lot. And there's a few sub options in here. So in there, we've got configure the lib retro options, which is the emulator that would that RetroArch would use basically. So in there we've got all which is exactly what um, we just looked at. If I select that I've got a nice um, a straightforward menu system and at the bottom there you can see that there's an explanation of each option as well to help you understand what change it would make um, and you can do all of them down there so you've got a lot more flexibility. There's probably even some extra options that aren't here if you really want to get into it but then you'd have to edit it manually um, like I've been doing on the screen below so um, these are the first 10 of the ones we saw or the first few sorry are the ones we saw earlier smooth aspect ratio um, shaders overlays then you can do other things um, audio driver video drivers um, how big your screen is you can specify that precisely there um, you can set video aspect ratios in a lot of detail and integer scaling to sort of force the um, ratio to be a multiple of the original um, custom viewport width that's to specify exactly how big the screen should be output if you don't want to um, if you don't want to say it's a multiple of uh, the original um, video font size that's just if I change that video font size edit currently 12 we'll make that 24 hit OK and we can see the change we've done there. If I scroll to the bottom here, it's probably put, oh no, okay, hang on. Um, is it OSD? Yeah, there we go. Video font size 24, so it's updated that as I've typed it. Now if I open the game now, you should see the bottom left corner, yellow text be much bigger. It's bigger, it's not that much bigger. I should probably go, um, Let's change that again. If I go to font size, I won't put 24, I'll put no, 70 or something. Run that again and you just see the size of the text, which is quite useful if you're debugging because it was massive, so you wouldn't want it that big, but you get the idea. So let's put that back to um, no, 20 or something. Uh, other options in here, uh, frames per second show. Let's have a look. So we've set that to true and if I can find where that is here FPS where's the cursor there that's not right there FPS show tree so now if I open that up we should see in the corner the frames per second that it's emulating at oh yeah bottom left okay so it's doing a count of the frames um, right so I'm getting 60, which you'd expect. Okay, um, back here, I'll just, I'll just reset that to be, oh, not that one, hang on. FPS, unset. 
Okay, uh, input overlay opacity. So if you use overlays that we saw earlier, you can change how transparent or not they appear, if they're either sort of solid or whether um, something should show through them. And controller options, and that's about it. So it's, like I say, it's e this is a good interface to be able to change something and easily change it back. So if you make a mistake, you can easily undo that. So it's a good way to test out those new settings. Um, and again, the same principle here, you can apply it to everything or you can apply it to a specific system only. And next option there, you've got manually edit retroarch configurations. So that way, if I go in here and I want to change the Mega Drive one, like that, I don't know, okay, yeah, Mega Drive retroarch CFG. And there, I've just got that same interface that I've got if I manually edit it here. Um, so that's giving you the same level of um, configuration ability without having to worry about doing it this way. So there's a lot of um, control you can do here. I could manually change those myself in that bit. Cancel that. Um, now what's really useful here, you can see that I can edit my controller file because it says all RetroArch joypads. So RetroArch configuration will use this controller file and the details in here include things like hotkeys. So I could go into that and I can see that to exit the emulator is button seven, which is my start button. And I could manually change that there if I want. And it's a good way to verify what hotkeys exist here. And I could also add a new hotkey, like maybe I want to have a, um, take a screenshot. I don't think that's a default one. So I could find the screenshot text and I'll just quit out that. I could find the screenshot text and I could add that in to be um, instead of um, a state uh, save state slot, I could ha um, rename that function to be um, uh, grab a screenshot. So you can edit all of your details quite easily in there. Okay, cancel out that. Um, again, you've got the all of the system specifics there. that work in just the same way as we saw on the Mega Drive one. I think the RPDist is the, um, the sort of clean file that you get in the version of RetroPie that you might be using. So I don't think you'd necessarily want to edit that, but you might want to view it to see what the defaults were. Um, and then you've got RetroArch Core options. So if with Mega Drive I was using uh, Genesis GX Plus, Genesis Plus GX, it's got the defaults here in text, so I could manually edit those as well if I wanted. I could enable. I could just type enable instead of um, disabled for overscan if I wanted, or um, region detect auto. I could probably. Well, you can obviously change anything that's listed here, and it's not just um, the Genesis Plus GX. It's all of the Libretro emulators. You've got Moopin 64, Moon 2003. Lots of sort of separate settings for those, so you can just go in here and tweak that. We've got the Pika Drive ones, and you can change them, um, I think, to the six button pad quite easily here as well. So that's what's in there. And actually, did it save that stupid change I just made? Yeah, let's get rid of that. Okay. Um, yeah, so that's the RetroArch configurations, then you can manually edit global configs. So in here, um, you could edit, this file here is an emulation station configuration section, which would be, um, I think we can get to it. Ooh. Oh yeah, hang on. Um, So this is the, that's the actual path for um, this config file ES input, and I wouldn't I wouldn't tend to try and tweak these unless you you're happy with you know what you're doing because they're often used to automatically create other config file other controller files. So if we looked in this one for example the emulation station uh, ES underscore input dot CFG, you can see there that we've got um, the buttons that emulation station 
need to navigate through it and you can tweak or reset if you want for example if I took out all of the text from input config type joystick down to input config and took those lines out then when I restarted emulation station it would prompt again for um, me to input my first controller values because it wouldn't be aware of any so that's there it's, it's useful for reference if nothing else uh, the log if you've got problems check out those logs I wouldn't again some of these are more for reference really than editing um, you've got the game list files here with emulation station so typically they will hold all your scrape data or data rela um, relating to the games that you've got so I haven't scraped any in this instance but if I did I could go in there and see what data it held against it and even edit it I could manually change the data that the scraper um, or emulation station shows against each game so you've obviously got one for each system there uh, down there you've got all RetroArch CFG which we've seen, we've seen a couple of times and you could manually edit that so if I go in there I've got the full file in a easy to access editable way you can just tweak away there and what else do we have down the bottom again uh, my controller file you can edit that um, one command launch dialog. I've forgotten that one. What's that there? Okay, so that's quite a lot of tweakable options for the run command um, dialog, which is the little box that pops up when you start playing a um, start choosing a game. It gives you the option to change particular emulator op um, options, so which of the emulators you want to run the game with, or and the output resolution and other things like that so you can change it quite a lot there and even disable it I think you, there's a on off function so it won't even show at all but yeah that's um, those options and what have we got down the bottom it was core options again and run command now this this file is useful yeah this file is useful to see Okay, so when run command runs, you can have a splash screen of the actual game that you're running. So it gives you a um, graphical output to say, oh, you know, this is the cover, cover art for Sonic that would flash up. And you can turn that on or off here. But that's also, if I show you on Emulation Station, you can get to that in another way um, that's a lot more clear. You just choose the run command editor, and that's um, another way of doing it. Okay. Cancel that. That's RetroArch, RetroArch core options, run command, run command launch dialog. Okay, so cancel that. And we can also edit non RetroArch configurations, as I said earlier. And here, I can't even remember what autoconf is. This file can be used to enable, disable RetroPy auto configuration features. Okay, so this might be when you configure your controller when you boot into Emulation Station in the first place, it automatically also creates controllers, controller configs for these systems. So you could um, tweak that there. Cancel that. Looked at those Emulation Station ones. And again, that these are the Emulation Station ones for the scrape um, content. And okay, so here. we've got each individual systems emulators.cfg so an example would be if we go to the Mega Drive one you can manually under emulators CFG you can see the first three are the emulators for a Mega Drive DGen, LR Genesis plus GX and LR Pika Drive and the default is Pika Drive and if I change that here to LR Genesis plus GX that's the one that would automatically be selected but as you've probably seen when you start a game you get the option in the run command dialog to do that at that point anyway so you wouldn't have to do it here it's just useful for reference to see what the default is without having to run it and um, you can change that to DJ where any of these um, names before the equal sign you could just put that down there and it would change the default and that's the same for any of those systems listed you can go into the, em um, the emulators.cfg file for any of those systems and do the same principle um, what else have we got? That's it in there, really. 
And the last one, manually edit all configurations. Okay, so that's self-explanatory. You just have the lot here and it covers uh, probably just about every file that you would want to access, view or edit. So it's quite easy to manage that without having to navigate through the Linux file system like um, you can do here. But uh, it's it's generally a really useful tool that I'd totally recommend to change the settings, particularly if you're trying to get a better video output, because they're the ones, if we go back there, that are in the basic section. And if I was to go for, I don't know, near mm, Mega Drive, um, I can quickly and easily try a shader or um, overlays. And there are some other um, overlays and shaders available out there that you can download and copy to your Pi if it's not one that's already available here but um, these options certainly make it much easier to manage um, and get the right output because the developers could choose to guess what they think is best for you but it's much better this way to set everything to quite a sort of clean vanilla default and let you go in and choose exactly what you prefer even if um, maybe some of you want a 16-9 ratio output but um, I wouldn't recommend it and um, that's it. If you've got any questions, um, I will do my best to answer it in the YouTube comments there. And I'll also put a link to the wiki about this, which is also really useful. But hopefully that's made it um, clear about how that all ties in together and how you can access that using the emulation station interface rather than having to do anything too technical. Okay, thanks.